Tonight, is Amazon getting into online travel? Uber's bad PR forces privacy changes at rival Lyft. And why the European Parliament wants to break up Google? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 221 for Friday, November 21st, 2014. This episode is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step-by-step -step repair guides, high-quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code TN2 at checkout. Hello, everyone. I am Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Federal Communications Commission Chairman Tom Wheeler said in a Q&A after an FCC meeting that he expects the commission to be sued for not moving more quickly on reclassifying internet services as a utility. President Obama called on the FCC to issue final rules on November 10th, but Wheeler says that he's taking his time because he wants to make sure the commission's net neutrality rules aren't overturned in court. AT&T and Verizon have already threatened to sue the FCC over new rules under consideration. Wheeler also said that the FCC, quote, will incorporate the president's submission into the record of the open internet proceeding, but that the FCC is an independent agency and doesn't exactly have to do everything the president wants. You might be able to buy your next hotel stay via Amazon. Travel news site Skift is reporting that Amazon is gearing up to launch its own travel service, offering booking at smaller hotels and resorts near major cities. The international initial rollout, rather, of Amazon travel would feature a curated selection of hotels within a few hours' drive from New York, Los Angeles, and Seattle, and would go live possibly around January 1st. Skift cites representatives of three independent hotels who had signed up for the service or were strongly considering signing up for the service. So if you're wondering how it works, properties would describe their room types and availability and pricing and add photos into an Amazon extranet and then would pay a standard 15% commission to Amazon for prepaid bookings. And then the properties would get notified by Amazon via email of bookings and then they would update their calendars on the extranet. Sounds kind of wonky, but hey. At least it's Amazon. In more Amazon news, there's quite a bit of it today, in fact. The New York Post is reporting the company is launching new ad-supported streaming service early next year that would be separate from its $99 a year Prime membership, which also includes a video service. Now, Prime's big bonus is two-day shipping, but about half of Prime subscribers use the video service. That makes out to around 25 million people, sources tell the Post. Now, to compare, Netflix has 33 million domestic subscribers, so Amazon already really has a leg up. In other words, it's a big revenue opportunity for Amazon if it can lure in free users and then convert them to Prime subscribers. Okay, one more Amazon story and then I'm done. The company is leasing 470,000 square feet of space in Midtown Manhattan. It's a property adjacent to the uh, Empire State Building, which the Wall Street Journal reports will be same-day shipping hub and part warehouse and even Amazon's first customer-facing brick-and-mortar location. They're citing people familiar with the matter. The lease is good for 17 years and may eventually be a space to showcase inventory like Kindle e-readers or Fire tablets and even set-top boxes. Okay, let's all agree that Uber had a really bad PR week. We all know that. Part of which was the existence of what's known as the God view, which is Uber's way to track people that are taking Uber rides in real time. Now, rival service Lyft has changed its privacy policy, announcing new technical restrictions on its employee access to user data. The company will now grant access to employees who need it to do their jobs. Everyone else will be blocked. Ride sharing service Sidecar is also called for an internal review of its privacy policy in light of the Uber incidents. It's not just car apps either. Anonymous messaging app Secret has privacy policies, including limitations on employees who, quote, do not have the ability to access private user data. The small number of senior uh, employees who do have access use it strictly to resolve security concerns and to respond to governmental requests and emergencies. Even bigger companies like Facebook forbid employees to access, disclose, or retain any Facebook user data unless they need that access to do their job like technical support or fixing bugs. An electronics record system logs activity and then the company has an oversight process. This is according to a Facebook spokesperson. And access is tiered and limited by job function. 
As for Uber, the company has hired Harriet Pearson, former chief privacy officer for IBM, to review the company's practices. All right, something's going on in Europe, and it might not be good for Google. We have Chris Davies, who's the executive editor of Slash Gear, on the horn to tell us more about what's going on. Hey, Chris. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for being here. So the European Union, if I understand correctly, wants Google Search to be separated from the rest of all of Google services, of which there are many. What, what's happening? Right. It's pretty complicated and at the same time it's pretty straightforward um so this uh, we're actually, it's not the european commission at first it's the european parliament and mm. so they are looking at all of the different ways that google is seen as being uh, dominant in search and so a draft proposal that's been seen by a couple of uh, sites the financial times reported on earlier today reuters uh, weighed in a little bit um a short while after they're talking about the different ways that they could maybe curtail some of google's power and stop it from taking advantage of its dominant position and one of the things that they're talking about and kind of putting forward as a suggestion is that they unbundle, as they say, the search engine from commercial services, which would mean that search would be different from AdWords advertising, for instance. So that would be, it would be a huge change in how obviously Google is set up. Now, if this was something that, let's say, it goes forward uh, in Europe, how do you think that that would change the way that the company does business there since it would just be one specific large market, but one specific market. Yeah, I mean, the European market is huge for Google. Google uh, estimates are that it has around 90% of market share in, in Europe, which is just enormous. And that's what's given a lot of the European um, countries sort of uh, pause over the power that Google has. And then there's been an awful lot of kind of bad blood between uh, Europe and Google ever since maybe 2010, when they were accused of kind of burying some of the smaller search engines in the search results. And since then, there have been a few different uh, issues that have kind of simmered to the surface, whether it's things like whether Google's paying sufficient taxes, whether they have a, a privacy policy which contravenes different European countries' own laws about privacy and data handling, and how they're promoting their own services. So that's things like Google Shopping Search, which uh, Google gets paid for to show um, search store results from, from the retailers. What's worth mentioning is that even if they do put this proposal forward and it gets uh, approved and the, and the European Parliament puts it forward, that doesn't actually mean that anything will necessarily happen. They don't have any regulatory control. All they can do is tell the European Commission that this is what they think they should do, and the European Commission can then consider whether it wants to put any legislation into place. If the European does want to go forward with this, the fact that Google is obviously a, a US-based company, does that, you know, is, is that a leg up for Google if they're going to have to fight something like this in court? I think they already fight an awful lot uh, on the European market. They have some really, really good, very proficient um, sort of legislative affairs experts who really shout and fight their corner. Um, they've been fighting for a long time. This isn't anything new particularly. This is just the this is the latest foray in it. I think, obviously, if they were forced to in some way change their business practices, that would be a huge deal. You know, they, Google tries an awful lot, um, but it always seems to come back down to you know, the power of advertising revenue and the power of search and that being such a considerable part of their business. So it, it would demand some pretty big changes in the future. As a European, I must ask you, what is what is the overall feeling of, you know, not that you can speak for all of Europe, but do people feel in general in Europe that, that Google is too powerful, that, that it needs to be somehow unbundled? Well, I mean, I'd like to think that I can speak for every single European. Um, <laughs> I mean, you might as well. Here we why are. Why not? I mean, uh, as the, you know, as the only European here, perhaps. I, can. <laughs> I think there is a, a sense, just as in the US, that you know, what started out as a company with a very clear moral message, um, the, the demands of also making a profit for shareholders uh, kind of get in the way of that sometimes. And people, even if they're not concerned about what their data, what, what's being done with their data and kind of the prominence of Google, they're at the same time thinking, well, you know, all of my eggs can be in one basket. If you're using Google for search, if you're using Gmail, Google Calendar, all of the different kind of properties that Google has, um, you're relying an awful lot on one company. And should something go wrong with that company, should you contravene a terms of service by by mistake, all of a sudden your accounts go down the drain. I think there's a general sort of wariness of any one company having that degree of control, uh, not to mention any one company having that degree of kind of insight into your privacy. 
Chris Davies is the executive editor at Slash Gear. Thanks so much for joining us and giving us a little bit more insight on what's going on with the European Parliament and Google. Before we let you go, remind folks where they can keep up with you. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at C underscore Davies and you can find all the Slash Gear content on Twitter as well at, uh, at Slash Gear and at Slash Gear.com. Thanks very much, Sarah. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Have a good weekend. You too. All right, coming up, Aereo is calling it quits. Nobody was really surprised, but hey, it's official now. We're getting there anyway. And why the leader of the free world is still rocking a BlackBerry? You might know the answer to that, but we'll tell you a little bit more about it in just a few. But first, let's talk about the holidays. Hey, I mean, Thanksgiving's next week, right? It's basically holiday season, whether you want it to be or not. So you should give the gift of DIY repair with iFixit's Pro Tech Toolkit. The ProTech Toolkit has 70 tools, 70, to assist you with a mod or a malfunction or just any sort of misfortune that may come your gadget's way. It includes iFixit's 54-bit driver kit with standard and specialty and security bits. It also includes ESD-safe precision tweezers, an anti-static wrist strap, an opening tool so you can get inside phones or notebooks or tablets or, or game consoles. It's it's really, I mean, there's, there's everything in there. It's lightweight, it's compact, easy to pack up, it's very durable, and it's really a gold standard for electronics work. Home DIYers, the FBI, everybody needs a toolkit. And more importantly, the ProTech toolkit is used by computer and smartphone repair technicians everywhere. They know they know the parts that you need. So if those guys are using it, why not have your own? iFixit has something for every DIYer, hacker, and geek on your shopping list this year. Head over to ifixit.com slash twit for the ProTech toolkit and other holiday deals. Enter the code TN2 at checkout and you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's iFixit fixit.com slash twit. And thanks to iFixit for sponsoring this episode of TN2. All right, on to a few more stories that we're following today. There are so many stories, especially for a Friday. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's sad, but it's not a huge surprise. After a recent round of layoffs, streaming TV service Aereo has filed for Chapter 11 reorganization in bankruptcy court. That was today. Aereo launched in 2012 and allowed users to watch almost live TV on any internet connected device through micro antennas that were stored remotely in one of Aereo's several antenna farms. The company was sued by a handful of broadcast networks who argued that Aereo was illegally retransmitting their copyrighted work and violating the Copyright Act. Eventually, the Supreme Court agreed earlier this year and Aereo was deemed illegal. Could not figure out how to turn that around. Sorry, Aereo. It was a good idea. Chromebooks are based on storing things in the cloud, which is why if you have a Chromebook, you probably don't have a lot of onboard storage. Now, to make that strategy sound even sweeter to prospective buyers, Google is giving Chromebook buyers one terabyte of Google Drive storage free for two years if you buy a new Chromebook between now and January 1st. A year of Google Drive at that one terabyte plan normally costs $9.99 per month. There aren't even any yearly subscription options, so the deal would save a buyer about $240 for a couple of years. Not a bad deal, of course, if you're interested in embracing the cloud anyway. Cloud's not perfect. Square founder Jack Dorsey confirmed to CNN that his company's payment processing service will support Apple Pay in the coming months, which brings Apple Pay to more small business owners who already use Square. The existing Square reader can process credit card payments via an iPad or an iPhone, but the hardware doesn't yet support NFC, so it can't handle wireless transmissions required by Apple Pay. Now, Square is currently working on an EMV chip card reader that it plans to introduce this spring in 2015, but that hardware doesn't support NFC either. So it's not exactly clear when in 2015 an NFC compatible Square reader might be released, but according to the founder, not that long. Finally, you know who really loves their BlackBerry besides Kim Kardashian? President Barack Obama. Yes, he recently actually got off boarding a Marine One helicopter to fetch his BlackBerry. At least that's what he told reporters. Obama has been kind of a holdout among BlackBerry users. He, he just didn't want to switch over to anything else. Back in March, then spokesman Jay Carney said that the White House was sticking with BlackBerrys and not participating in a pilot program with phones running Google's Android software. I say blame Canada. 
And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Thanks for being here. Happy Friday, everybody. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. We want to hear what you think. And of course, you can watch live every weekday, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss Tech News today. That's our morning news program, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane, and math is hard. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.